Uh, thanks very much for coming tonight. Uh, this is a, a panel of the Center on Global Energy Policy here at uh, Columbia University. And we're here to uh, celebrate the second anniversary of the uh, release of uh, Bob McNally's book on uh, volatility in oil markets, which is the first book edited by the Columbia University uh, Energy Series uh, under the auspices of the center. Um, Bob is, to my left, uh, best known as the um, drummer for the uh, band uh, Sound Policy, which is <laughs> performing Friday in Bethesda. Uh, but he also dabbles in unsound policy at his times, <laughs> and uh, he did it for the George W. Bush administration <laughs> uh, a few years ago. Uh, since then, he's been uh, in first in a hedge fund, and over the last few years, he's been running his own consultancy, the Rapidan Group or Rapidan Energy Group in in Washington. Uh, he's uh, a non-resident fellow of the center as are my other uh, neighbors to my right. Uh, Marianne Ka, who uh, most of you will uh, know as the former chief economist of uh, Conoco, uh, and a very active uh, scholar here at the center, uh, doing a lot of work on transportation uh, and uh, transportation fuels. And Jamie Webster, uh, who comes from the consulting <coughs> and, uh, uh, side of the business. So uh, Marianne, mostly from industry, uh, Jamie from consulting. Uh, all of my uh, three uh, co-participants tonight are uh, lifelong or career-long OPEC watchers and market watchers with deep expertise and deep experience uh, in the oil market. It's a good time to discuss the oil market because as, as we always say, uh, we're at a crossroads, things are changing, things have never been as uh, dynamic as they are today. It's always true, but it's truer now than it's been in the past, probably less than tomorrow, but uh, very much true at the moment. Uh, it's also a good time to revisit uh, the thesis of Bob McNally. So I've known Bob McNally for maybe 20 years, so I've known his slides for probably 20 years, but when the shale revolution uh, took off, it really gave his, his slide a, a big boost and uh, resulted in a, in a very uh, important book that had a big influence, probably a bestseller for academic books on the, on the topic. Um, but uh, this was a few years ago when the shale revolution was still young. Uh, shale now is changing. It's uh, shale 102 or 201 or 202. Uh, it's not quite the same shale industry as it was when the book came out. So it's a good time to uh, test again the uh, hypothesis and the, the thesis that Bob uh, presented. So the uh, event will uh, essentially uh, proceed in, in three steps or two steps. Bob will uh, first uh, discuss a few of his ideas, uh, show some, some version of his slides, and then Marianne and uh, Jamie will uh, uh, pipe in with their comments and will uh, from there, we go to a, a, a sort of moderated discussion, uh, not only of Bob's book, but of the market today and the outlook for, for the market. Great, thank you. Should <clears throat> so I should say that this event is, uh, is recorded and uh, live streamed, and uh, it's possible to, to ask questions uh, on Twitter uh, and uh, submit questions that, that way. Thank you very much, Antoine. Thank you all for coming. Uh, our goal is to break up before the State of the Union, right? We want to, that's right. Um, I want to thank uh, Marianne and Jamie, as well as Antoine, uh, folks I've known uh, for combined decades and whose experience and knowledge of the oil industry I deeply, deeply um, respect and appreciate. You know, I was speaking about it earlier, writing a book is my first book. Um, and I, I didn't realize what a team effort it is. And it's not just the folks who helped you on the book, and so much more than a great editor I had and so forth, but your professional colleagues, and Jan Stewart and others are in the crowd here, people who've helped build your knowledge over the years too, so I'm very appreciative. And I want to say thank you uh, and how happy I am to be a, a non-resident fellow at the Columbia Center on Global Energy Policy and to Jason Bordoff, who had my 
job for the President Obama, and I'm so glad to be a Republican, I guess, representative here on the, on the staff. And uh, so grateful for Jason for encouraging me to write the book and promoting it uh, along with his colleagues here. I also want to recognize uh, my intrepid book research assistant, Fernando Ferreira. Fernando, would you please stand up? Fer Fernando uh, was really the brains and the brawn behind this book. We realize when we talk about crude oil price volatility, the word volatility really doesn't, me doesn't, it doesn't, doesn't capture the essence of what I'm talking about because we're talking about swings in prices whose amplitude and causes we haven't seen in nine decades. And to get a picture of that, we had to build a crude oil price series monthly going all the way back to 1859. We also decided we need more spare capacity data than we can get online from EIA and others, and so Fernando was instrumental, among other things in uh, building that spare capacity database. So, and he is now a, a colleague of mine at Rapid Energy Group. Uh, check him out after if you want to really know what's going on in Venezuela. Uh, he's got the goods. And I'm here also with my colleague, Leslie Hayward, who recently joined us as a friend and former client who does our business development. So I hope you'll say hello to Leslie and Fernando after the, after the talk. Okay, let's go on here. What I was hoping to do is first figure out how to work uh, this device. There we go. And then, uh, sort of summarize the questions the book attempted to an answer uh, and address, and, um, and then look forward a little bit. And I do look forward, and I want to get right to the Q&A and, and your comments and questions. Now, first of all, you say, well, Bob, you wrote a book saying crude oil prices are volatile? Please. I mean, what? that is not new news. Everybody, you know, folks with more gray hair than me know you've been up and been down. I mean, let's move on to the State of the Union, if that's all you're going to talk about. And I say, well, wait a minute, though. The volatility we've seen in the last 10 to 15 years, we haven't seen in modern times. You never see a, a quintupling in prices like we did from 03 to 05 without a war in the Persian Gulf. You just don't see those bigger moves without some sort of geopolitical uh, catalyst. It could be an actual disruption, fear, or both, hoarding, and so, so forth, in, in, since the 1970s without a, without a war. And you just don't see a 60% collapse in six months, as we saw in late 2014, early 2015, without either a recession or somebody deliberately gunning the supply of oil suddenly, which Saudi Arabia did in 1986. That's the exception that proves the rule. So news, this is what ma made me write the book, is seeing this price behavior and saying something else is going on. We don't have the usual sp suspects that cause these price spikes in the early 70s, the late 70s, the Gulf War. And, uh, and recessions, the cause, well, something else is going on and we've got to figure out what it is. And what my research really showed, uh, first of all, uh, is we need to remind ourselves why oil as a commodity is especially prone to wild boom-bust price cycles or big price swings. And that gets into the inelasticity of supply and demand to price uh, in the short run. And uh, storage can help moderate that but can't uh, solve it. And so that's all in chapter four. So we kind of walk through and say, let's just step back for a second and say, oil is especially prone when market forces are working toward wild oil price swings. And the next idea is that when oil transitioned or graduated from an illumination to a transportation fuel oh, 100 and some years ago, it suddenly became the lifeblood of modern civilization. So now we have the most important commodity in the world, other than food, but essential for food production, that is prone to unacceptable swings in prices. And you put those two things together, and then the experience of boom-bust eras we've had in the past, and you get to what that picture shows, which is a Texas governor from a state that is the most dedicated to free markets and keeping government out of the affairs of business decisions, sending troops into the fields to prod drillers away from their property at Bayonet Point, and then create and install the most effective Maoist centralized, heavy-handed control of private sector I think we've ever seen on the planet, the Texas Railroad Commission, which kept oil prices stable. Please ignore the shameless plug. I, I don't know how that got in there for the book. That's, that's, yeah. that's uncalled for. So what we did is we built this series, Fernando and I. We took monthly price seri prices going all the way back to 1859. And what we saw is that oil prices, never perfectly stable, but were unusually volatile. Um, during periods when there was no swing producer or some entity that stepped in, commercial, government, or both, and said, we're going to put a stop to this nonsense. We are going to introduce what naturally doesn't exist in the oil market, which is a very flexible supplier. 
And our goal and our sole goal is to anchor long-term prices so that investors don't overinvest, the industry can have certainty, and then all the consumers and all the central bank planners and all the defense departments and everybody else who relies on oil can be reasonably certain of a price range for oil. Because with that, without that, the world doesn't work well. But to do that in the short run, we have to be like a central bank. We have to be able, meaning legally authorized too, able, willing, to quickly, meaning weeks, uh, adjust supply up, which is the fun part, down, which is the not fun part, and hold it there for a long time to convince investors that we are committed to this price target. That's the secret sauce. And my book concluded the reason you saw this, you've seen this unusual wide, unusually wide amplitude of prices recently, and the usual suspects, wars and recessions, not causing those, is what you have is supply and demand with no effective swing producer. OPEC is AWOL. And so we attempted to do some uh, metrics on this. We, uh, Fernando and I took our monthly price series, and we took the range during a year, uh, and we looked at the percentage change in that range, and then we averaged it over our eras. So what we saw is you had first boom bust era, the average, uh, Range was 53%. Mr. Rockefeller, the first swing producer, did it indirectly through refining and, and midstream, comes in, crushes it in half. We bust up Standard Oil, don't like uh, evil co corporate titans like him. Back to boom bust, the last prolonged boom bust period from, from 1911, the breakup of Standard Oil, until 1932. And then the Texas c come in, bayonets and all, Mao Zedong, and they crushed oil price volatility. They pinned prices. And we'll show, so show shortly, the actually the most fundamentally unbalanced decade, I believe, in the history of the oil market where supply and demand were most out of whack was the 1950s. The 19, we brought all those Middle East fields on board, and we hadn't had the 60s demand and 70s demand take off. And you'll see that with the spare capacity numbers. Yet we, the, it was probably the most boring decade for price movements. Why? The Texas Railroad Commission, Seven Sisters, extremely forceful and careful control of production. So uh, what can we say going forward? I think we can say that we have two ways to think about the price of oil, the range over the long term. There's controlled when an effective swing producer comes in and says, we're going to pin it from here uh, between this range. And we have the tools and ability to willing to do so. If you don't have that, the range we ex should expect for oil prices through the medium to long term cycles is shut in to demand destruction. These are the things that are politically unacceptable, but that's what they are, shut in and demand destructions. So if we have a swing producer going forward, uh, maybe it'll be OPEC plus, we'll talk about that in a second. Maybe it'll be shale, shale some people say. What the world really needs is someone to come in and say, okay, that was enough of that roller coaster ride. The third boom bust era is officially over. We're here, and we're going to impose a $60 to $80 Brent price range for the next 30 years. Everybody plan on that. We'd all be very happy, I think, except for perhaps some hedge funds, successful traders and storage owners. Everybody else would be very happy with that. If we don't have that, we're going to have, uh, uh, I think, single to teens uh, up into the well into the hundreds uh, through these cycles. So the world right now, in my view, needs a swing producer. Uh, there's a chart long term showing oil supply and demand uh, from uh, Equinor. Uh, sorry, uh, BP is the history and Equinor is the projections. And everyone has their different projections and is peak demand real? Will EVs take off? And we can debate that all day. But with the world's middle class rising from you know a billion to two or three billion, and of this you know to go, the population going seven to ten, and everyone seeming to like to drive and food and plastics and all that kind of stuff, safe bet there's a lot of demand coming for oil, and uh, we're not sure where we're going to get all the new supply from. And uh, the one thing we do really need, though, and would help in balance that market is to have and, and to keep geopolitics and macroeconomic stability is a swing producer to come in and provide that that price stability that Rockefeller did that enabled kerosene to explode and the Texas, uh, Texas uh, um, Railroad Commission and Seven Sisters did to let gasoline explode. Now remember, the first cars were electric. And in 1900, a third of the cars were electric, a third were ethanol, and a third were gasoline. It, gasoline was not an obvious uh, natural winner. One of the reasons gasoline was a winner in the race for transportation, one of the reasons, is because the oil industry and the Texas Railroad Commission came together and promised the investors in cars that we could provide abundant, stably priced oil for a long time. We really need that going forward. All right, who are the candidates? We need a swing producer. We've heard two recently since the book came out. Um, 
One is U.S. Shale, and the other is, I guess, OPEC Plus, for want of a better name. I know they're searching for a, a new name and an organization. They're going to be meeting on that this weekend. Um, maybe we can get into the shale discussion uh, in the panel. Uh, I think the jury is sort of in, and the verdict is pretty clear. In my view, shale oil is in no way, shape, or form a replacement for the Texas Railroad Commission or OPEC as it should have functioned as a swing producer. It has none of the qualities I just listed. Legally and ably act to, uh, able to act quickly uh, over a long duration with the sole goal of stabilizing prices, not maximizing profits. Um, it has none of that. It is more flexible than conventional upstream production. Yes, it is more flexible. And I think there's an argument to be had or a debate over whether that flexibility adds to or contributes to long-term prices and the, amp and the amplitude of the, of the price swings. I think we can have a debate there. Um, long story short, if, if we're not going to have peak demand and shale oil is going to scare off other upstream investment, shale could be contributing to long-term price volatility by denying us the investment we'll need in five to seven years when peak demand turns out to have been wishful thinking. Just one theory. Uh, maybe, maybe, maybe not. Um, the other and the more likely replacement, in my view, for to provide, and this is going to shale. I mean, let me go back to shale in a second. I think the recent history has shown uh, shale's sort of onrush has been both stabilizing and destabilizing, which is one reason why I think you can have a debate. From 1910 to 20, 000, 2010 to 13, uh, shale oil was you know, boomed up to 2010 there. You can see it up there, 11 to 13. Shale was stabilizing force, I, and I, I believe. We were sanctioning Iran's exports. Spare capacity was very tight. Demand was robust. I, don't, I, I think we would have gone back into the triple digits had it not been for shale showing up. And that just happened to coincide fortuitously uh, there. But then, in my view, shale's continued onrush was destabilizing, in part because Saudi Arabia refused to cut underneath it, famously on Thanksgiving Day in 2014. And the Russians also refused to go along with Saudi Arabia in cuts, and down we went, ultimately, to $26 a barrel. So I don't think, I'm not going to say shale caused the collapse, but shale was a contributing factor to the collapse in prices. Shale, uh, uh, again, this is what caused these collapses since the very first days. Uh, onrush of new supply that's outside the swing, pro swing producer, the swing producer proves ineffective in, in meeting that, and the price then goes into boom-bust mode. So I really think we're looking for a swing producer. Um, uh, I make the point here that uh, now some folks say, well, OPEC plus is it. And, and how to think about this new Russian-Saudi alliance? Are they the new kind of swing producer? Will they be the fourth producer? I think the jury in this case is out. It's, we don't know for sure. It's possible. There are two ways to think about swing producers. Every time prices bust, you get a swing producer. Fear impels the oil industry to collaborate. The first swing producer was called the Oil Creek Association. It formed in November of 1861, during the very first oil price boom. They all swore, the producers in, in Pennsylvania, to not exceed the limits until gas, oil prices got back to $4 a bit. They pledged their sacred honor. They signed papers. They published in the newspapers. It lasted about four months. Um, and over history, and even through boom-bust eras, you've seen price busts, sort of, they say, cartels are the children of, crisis, uh, of a crisis. Well, so are these swing producers. So on the one hand, OPEC, remember, what changed things around was in February of 2016 when crude prices fell to $26 a barrel. And it would have kept falling, in my view, had not Minister Novak from Russia said, OK, we've had enough pain. We're willing to, Russia is willing to cut. And then Minister Naimi from Saudi Arabia said, well, fine. If you're willing to cut, then we're willing to cut. So let's talk about cuts. And whoosh, the price went right back up. So once again, uh, a price bust scared the stuffing out of producers and impelled a swing producer organization. The question is, will they be long-lived, like the Texas Railroad Commission and OPEC, or will they be more of a flash in the pan, like the Oil Creek Association, the Petroleum Producers Association in the late 1870s, et cetera? Now, a lot of folks say, well, haven't you seen? We had this inventory oversupply, and it cleaned up pretty nicely. We're back to kind of stable, normal prices, and that was because of these cuts that Russia and Saudi Arabia put through, ergo, we ha seem to have an effective swing producer. 
again, I, we can debate that all night. I think they no doubt played a role. The cutbacks, mainly by Saudi Arabia, played a role. But the real reason those inventories cleaned up in the second half were a series of tragedies, which once again came to the aid of the oil industry, starting with massive once-in-a-lifetime storms and the knocking out of a third of US refining capacity, Harvey and Nate, and then prolonged outages in the Keystone and 40s pipeline system to throw in just for a little cherry on top, the KRG thought it would be a good idea to declare independence. It was promptly invaded, and we lost 300,000 barrels a day of Iraqi supply. All this helped to clean up. So I think OPEC plus, the Saudi OPEC cuts, uh, had played a role, but they had a lot of help from their friends, disaster and tragedy, in, 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 in lowering those inventories and cleaning up the market. So here again, I want to sort of put up a comparison table and ask ourselves, you know, what are, the, what, are the, what are the characteristics of an effective swing producer based on the research we've done? And there's a whole argument, by the way, the free market can do this. We may hear this tonight, that you don't even need government, that you should just let the free market, and this was debated in the 20s and the 50s, and we can have that debate. And I'm not arguing that's wrong or right. I'm just kind of dissecting history. From history, here's, what, here's the characteristics of a swing producer. Uh, shale has none of them. Uh, OPEC plus, maybe. I and mean, maybe we can talk about that. I'm willing to be, I mean, either if OPEC plus, and they're talking this weekend about getting married and formally signing, a, becoming like having an organization and everything and a building, and, and if they do that and they get together time and they, they form an organization that is regularly able to adjust supply and convince the market they can anchor prices, then the third boom bust era identified in my book will have ended and the OPEC plus or whatever they're gonna call themselves era will have started. I've listed a bunch of issues here, but in the interest of time, and I really want to get to my panelists and hear from you, I'm just going to, um, I'm going to leave them out and say maybe we can talk about them. They have to get to what's moving the market now. I think President Trump has, in, has arrived as a very important factor in the oil markets uh, in regard, with regard to geopolitical, geopolitical risk and OPEC that is, in a, that is underappreciated. Um, and, um, there's an honorable mention for IMO 2020, and the one thing that's not mentioned here that I should have is Canada. Let me end with that. Again, I'm a conservative Republican. Uh, I tend to believe in letting market forces work, but I wrote a book basically saying, wow, sometimes it seems uh, supply control is a necessary evil because the alternative is this volatility that no one's stomach can really seem to handle. So I have sympathy for when governments intervene in, uh, in, in supply control. And Canada has done that. Alberta, the state of province of Alberta, has done that. Um, but you know, I think there's a difference. Uh, with Alberta, the issue is not about stabilizing the global or even regional oil market for the benefit of the oil industry, uh, the economy, the users of oil, uh, and broader sectors in policy making that rely crucially on stable energy prices. That is not the reason. The reason they had to intervene is because Canada can't agree to build pipelines to get that oil out. And so that problem has to be fixed. So I think it's in a little bit of a different box. Glad to see those uh, curtailments end. But I think it's an interesting, from the perspective of the book and what's happened, um, again, uh, never, never underestimate the lengths to which even free market oriented folks will go to put an end to boom bust oil prices. With that, I thank you for your attention. I really look forward to the commentary and the questions. Thanks again. Thanks very much, uh, Bob. That, that was great. So uh, I will um, not uh, use my prerogative as moderator to immediately jump in. There's a lot of food for thought there and a lot of things to disagree with. But first, I will uh, turn to Jamie, uh, to, because I think, Jamie, you have a, a view that actually uh, volatility, depending on how, how you measure it, how, how you define it, is actually down. Uh, over the last few years compared to what it was before shale. Yeah, thanks, Antoine. And uh, Bob, thanks for writing this book uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, I've enjoyed uh, uh, buying, as I told you before, three copies because of a, a, a variety of uh, reasons. Uh, I did uh, reread it and made a couple of notes on my latest Jeez, copy oh my uh, just, to, just to see where you, uh, where you got some things right. But uh, Antoine is right. So a, a couple of comments. So. Um, I agree with you uh, on your long-term views on, on volatility, but one of the things that we've been talking about um, over the, in, the, in the market over the last few years, and I will say that I also, as Shale came in, I was like, we're going to be looking for a more volatile period. But if you look at volatility, and, and you have a way of, of looking at it, there's lots of other ways as well, is that actually it seemed like oil was in a slightly more volatile 
uh, frame of mind from 2010 until the price decline, if you looked at it in terms of, uh, which I think is similar to what you look at, which is basically the range, you know, how much did it, did it range over that year? The difference is that it really, at that point, because prices were, then we're talking about, you know, 90 to 110 or, or whatever, that was where that volatility was really hitting consumers. And so it was impacting, do I want to buy an SUV or do I want to buy a small car versus for the oil companies, it was a, at these prices, uh, it's I'm making a lot of money or I'm making not quite so much money and my costs are going up because I can, I can afford this. Now we're back in, a, in we're, we're at this lower period and actually volatility to me seems, if you look at the numbers, is actually slightly lower on a kind of annualized basis. If you compare those two periods, kind of 2010 to 2013 and 2015 to 2018, uh, and we'll ignore 2014 because it was so um, crazy. But I think the difference is that this time it is now impacting the oil companies in that, you know, if you're paying 290 or $3 for gas, it doesn't quite change so much if you're going to jump from Tesla to the other. But for oil companies, it is crossing frequently that kind of cost of projects, which is making it very difficult for uh, the investors and for, um, uh, and for the boards to try to decide how things are going to look. And so actually, I think just strictly on a looking at it from a volatility standpoint, I would say it actually seems to be lower, but it is hitting in a way that for the industry is very difficult. And you raised some really good points about uh, peak demand, which is also, I think, um, playing into this, uh, into this. But I think it's in a, in a very difficult time. And it was that volatility was really hitting consumers before, but it's hitting producers now, which is why I think my second point, which is that you're seeing I'm not quite on the, mar we're going to go to market, but I do think we're moving to a slightly different thing. So you described shale 2010 to 2013 as a stabilizing force and that if we hadn't had it, prices would have gone up. But as you also know, that it wasn't just the one of the big major things. If you hadn't, uh, you had Libya production go offline, we had, the, uh, we had um, Saudi Arabia come in and put on more production, uh, you had the Iran sanctions. If any one of those four had not happened, prices would have arguably gone to 147 or down to the prices that we saw uh, in 2014. And so to me, as I look at, at now and I look at the intercessions in Canada, I look at the sanctions on Iran, I look at what's happening with Venezuela, I see, you know, OPEC saying, oh, we're going to, you know, we're going to increase production. No, 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 we're going to decrease production. There's an increase in these intercessions, which leads me to believe, okay, well, maybe we're actually moving not to who is the single swing supplier, and not maybe to a full-on market environment, but definitely something where you're you're in a much more, you know, multiple uh, realms of power yeah. uh, that can end up impacting the market, which makes our job much more difficult. And obviously, we'll have to charge significantly more uh, for these sort of this sort of analysis. But uh, again, thank you for the for the book, and uh, and uh, appreciate thank your, you your comments. Thank you. I'd like to comment on that also, and that. I think shale is still a stabilizing force in one perspective, and that is you have a lot of short-term volatility because they've become the de facto balancing factor. It's unintentional, but these producers live hand to mouth. So if there's too much production in the market, the price needs to drop to get them to stop investing. And when there's not enough, the price goes up. Well, that is short-term volatility by definition. So I agree that they have increased short-term volatility. but. The excursions outside the mean or outside a $50 to $65 price range are going to be much less, and they won't last more than 10 months, because that's about the full cycle time at most it will take to respond to price changes. So in some senses, the uh, price is actually much more stable in, in a longer term sense than it has been in the past. The other comment I'll make about OPEC is that it's not clear that they have ever truly been effective at managing prices. A true swing supplier would come in before you have inventories build up and would act preemptively. They, they cannot do that. They can only act, as you said, in emergencies. So they do not really make a good swing supplier. In fact, I'm the free market person he was probably referring to earlier. You know, I believe that most interventions one could make to try to get rid of the volatility will add another source of uncertainty and actually will make the volatility worse, becoming another unknown. So let's, let's try not to make the situation worse. I feel like we've had the same conversation last year, and somebody in the audience said, but if the consumers are upset because you know, gasoline is up a dollar, you have to do something. So 
my, I think policymakers ought to try to minimize the damage of what governments feel like they have to do in that situation. And I would also say, coming from an oil company, it's true, the smaller producers live hand to mouth and they will, you know, bring their, swing their production up and down because they don't have the cash to invest. But the larger companies invest over a 10-year time horizon, five to 10 years. So any, you know, any single price in any one year or an extreme doesn't impact investment decisions as much as you would think. And I will stop there. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, if I can jump in. Um, your book, uh, Bob, is, is very much a history of the oil industry through the oil price. It's all about the price, and that's the prism, prism through which you see the whole history of the industry. Uh, OPEC itself often defines, describes its role today as one of price stabilization. You know, they want to stabilize prices. But I, I kind of wonder if we're not putting too much uh, faith in that self-description, uh, if we should really take OPEC at face value when it says that that's what it wants to do. And if we're not overemphasizing the role in, in price in the oil industry. You, you said yourself that in the 50s, uh, supply and demand were in complete imbalance, yet the price was stable because the Texas Railroad Commission was very strong at, at managing the market. But should then the price stability be the real benchmark, or should the supply-demand balance be the, be the benchmark? And a couple of points. In, in a way, I kind of wonder if the big swings in prices we've seen recently, what you call volatility, uh, is really an expression of OPEC's lack of power, of OPEC's failure, or of OPEC's power and ability to inflict major pain on the market by pushing the price up and making production completely inefficient, and then pushing the price down and wiping out all the inefficient producers. In that sense, OPEC has been extremely efficient in the last few years. They, they haven't wiped out shale because shale didn't turn out to be the, the low cost producer, uh, the high cost producer, but they've wiped out Canada, they wiped out Venezuela, which is a high cost producer today. So they've done a really good job and I don't really see why they're, they're in, they, they have a problem. Hmm. Okay, thank you very much for those comments. Um, I guess just a few responses and then open to discussion, okay. No, Jamie, I, I take your point, and had I had uh, wanted to use some more time and pull back up the price chart, a phenomenon that we see in this and prior boom-bust eras are interludes of stability. Uh, I call them new normals, right? They're the new normal. There was the $90 to $100 new normal that affected uh, consumers. Uh, there was the 45 new normal, uh, and I think we're kind of in a 60 new normal. So you've seen that. Uh, if you look at the monthly price series, even in the 1860s and 70s, when we were in booming and busting, you'd often get two or three years of relatively stable prices. Uh, same goes in the 19-teens and 20s. I don't know exactly why that is. It's use, I wonder if it doesn't have something to do with the market's transitioning from a, a over to an undersupply. There's something there where there's just an eye of a storm effect. I, I, I need to do more research on it. And so I think if you take those slices and measure volatility in more traditional forms, I think you will, you will see them more, more um, you know, perhaps you know, lower if you compare them and so forth. I am really talking about, as Marianne's called it, the, the excursions outside the band, okay? And, um, but, and I, I take your point about how, how companies and consumers are feeling that. Um, let's see, on the, uh, Marianne, your point, yes, that OPEC was not that good, amen. I mean, I, I, if you put, if you remember the, the the volatility metric that I put up. Um, we kind of measured, in a way, how effective Rockefeller, OPEC, and the Texas Railroad Commission were. And I did that by saying, okay, while these folks were running the show, did they sort of compress the amplitude of price ranges based on my kind of average of, of, of monthly ranges? And remember, Rockefeller got to a 24%, which was half of what the previous boom bust, so a huge improvement. He had to do it in, indirectly, as I said, by, by, by organizing and monopolizing the refineries and then colluding and coordinating with the railroads and the pipelines. OPEC uh, was also about 25%, never as coherent, as effective, as forward-leaning as the Texas Railroad Commission. And one thing I, I really enjoyed doing and learning about the most in this book is the mechanisms by which not only the Texas Railroad Commission and other oil-producing states met and every month and created a call on Texas, and then assigned 
quotas well by well, field by field for a month, and then met again the next month and did it again. Imagine OPEC when they meet. It's every six months, and, and no one goes along with the quota. I mean, and forward-leaning. And then those companies, the seven sisters, getting together and, and colluding and controlling exactly how they're going to deliver in price gasoline in Rotterdam and Venice and so forth. I mean, the system of control, whether you – I'm not a particular fan of, of government control of anything, but, oh, my, you marvel at it. And that is why they crushed that volatility to 4 percent. So I 100 percent agree OPEC was not as effective – swing producer uh, as the Texas Railroad Commission. As for the excursions outside the, these bands, I mean, we'll see. I guess we can argue a counterfactual. In my view, the oil price would not have stopped in February of 2016 falling had not Minister Novak and Minister Naimi met in, in the Doha on February 15th and uttered the words, conditional cuts. I believe, I could be wrong, can't be prove it, can't prove it, the price would have fallen to shut in. And shut in, shale wasn't falling fast enough, uh, and shut in is probably stripper wells in the United States, very mm -hmm. high cost marginal wells. Maybe it's Canadian projects, but I think it would have been a lot lower, 16, 6 or lower. Um, and again, we'll debate, we should probably ha get together in 10 or 15 years, but um, we'll see if uh, a world going from 7 to 10 billion people with a growing middle class that likes all the beautiful things that come from hydrocarbons, um, if the demand for that incremental crude can be met solely by shale, not only that we continue to produce at these volumes, but that shale as a quality provides us the products we need out of the refining system we have. Uh, and those are all issues, and I, if I could be wrong, um, but I'm going to suggest that we're going to see uh, excursions outside of a, whatever new normal range you want to call it. Today it might be 60 to 80, before it was 40 to 60. It seems when we settle down for about a few months to quarters, everyone decides it's the new normal. But I think we are going to, uh, if we don't see an effective swing producer, um, uh, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna see excursions. I think were they to be effective, OPEC plus looking forward, your point is very well taken. They, Saudi Arabia should be saying, oh, my golly, if I really believe this, uh, this story that the Saudis tell about uh, it, this insatiable thirst for oil and inadequate investment, which the IEA, where Antoine right. works, always talks about. We're not investing enough. If I believe that, Saudi Arabia should be, should be investing in upstream production capacity to 15 or 17, and so should everybody else. So they're not, and I think they know we're going to be tight going forward, and I think we'll see excursions um, outside there. But um, uh, let's see. And then um, uh, on, on, I do think they never admit it publicly. Um, uh, Rockefeller didn't. Uh, Oklahoma, which is actually the first state, you got to give credit to Oklahoma. Texas gets bigger and they always get the credit. Actually, Oklahoma went first on, on quotas and everything. Uh, but Oklahoma and OPEC, I think, rarely say price stability is our goal. Rarely. This, it's making sure there's stability in markets, supply and demand is balanced, avoiding big builds and, or declines in, in, in inventories and so forth. I think they all tip around. They do all tip around. The Texas Railroad Commission swore up and down it wasn't about price control. It was about preventing waste. It was conservation. That was what they were doing, not fixing prices. But the dirty little secret, because they know the health of their industry, that the, the benchmark that those uh, planners and investors use is the price, current and future expected. What officials look at, what consumers look at, what voters look at is the price. That's what they care about. Look at a great example is last summer. You know, President Trump and the Trump administration wanted to zero out Iran's oil exports. And they said, we're going to, what part of zero do you not understand? We're, we're going to go to zero. Zero. And the market believed it. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, I'm sure the Saudis came along and said, we can replace all those barrels. As an as a Iranian barrel goes off, I, a, a OPEC barrel is going to go up. And you may have thought, now some folks are thinking, wow, if you can replace the barrels, that's just fantastic. Except that's not what really President Trump wanted the Saudis to do. He didn't really care about barrels coming on or coming off or this or that. He wanted gasoline to stay below $3 a gallon while he was driving around in oil. He doesn't care about barrel schmerels, okay? And the Saudis and others and Russians, the UAE came up, they did replace the barrels as Iran went off. But spare capacity went down. The price went up to $85 a barrel, and gasoline headed to $3 a gallon. So President Trump had to back off and, and, and go easier on Iran. And I raise that as just an example, I think, as a truism, everybody cares about the price. It's all about price stability. And 
forward lean, forward looking uh, swing producers and market management is all aimed at keeping current and then those future the anchoring those price expectations in my view but uh, you can see we can have grounds for disagreement could i have a point of yeah. clarification i actually yeah. agree with you you'll see excursions out of that range yeah. my point was they won't last more than 10 months okay because you'll start to see production investment and Fair production enough. coming back in the market or a recession so yeah right. so it, link, it it shortens the time that the excursions last right. is my point right fair enough no i think is it that awful things happen at the extremes you have shut-ins you have Alberta curtailments, um, or you have recessions. You kill, you kill demand, and then you can have a very quick turnaround. Uh, so no, I agreed on that. That's not a good policy. But your, your example you gave on the Iran, Iran sanctions is a great example of how government intervention can make it worse and right. add volatility and uncertainty. Right. And we had that coming up again in May in terms of whether the waivers sanctions. are in or out. Right, right. Yeah, you're welcome to ask questions, by the way, uh, both uh, in person and uh, via um, tweet. Uh, there's a question here. Uh, before we get to the gentleman here, uh, we, we've discussed a little bit the role of shale and whether it changed the, the picture for OPEC and for the market. Uh, what about Venezuela? Uh, this is a country that has the biggest reserves on Earth, uh, yet production is collapsing and uh, it's going to probably take a long time to rebuild uh, the uh, oil sector there uh, once a uh, change in government takes place. Uh, how uh, does that change the, uh, the story? Uh, does the world without Venezuela look different from the world with Venezuela as far as the oil market is concerned? Um, Marianne, you work for a company that was heavily yes. uh, invested, invested in, Venezuela, in Venezuela, so you've looked at this very closely. Yes, yeah. indeed. Um, I th well, right now, I think Venezuela crude has been problematic and its, its quality has been declining. So not only the volume, but the quality has been declining to the point that the old refining company that I worked with had actually stopped using Venezuelan oil, even though they were co-invested in two um, projects, the upgrading projects in their refineries. Um, so I think that the heavy oil is in decline now, and companies are going to have to substitute medium crudes. And that means these heavy oil upgrading refineries are going to be running their refineries in an inefficient fashion you won't get the same product yield. And why does that matter? We want to have higher distillate inventories going into the uh, marine sulfur regulations when they take place on January 1st, 2020, and you have to blend in more uh, low sulfur diesel fuel to, to meet the new standard. You now have the most sophisticated refineries in the U.S. who are going to be running um, suboptimal crude and not having the, the same product yield. Also, Venezuela will have a hard time selling its crude Yes, it could sell, probably sell more to China, but it doesn't get any revenue when it sells to China because China, you know, they owe China money. So they either get it very discounted or they don't get any revenues at all. No one really, there's a lot of uh, lack of transparency about the deals now. So I think that you could get more heavy oil production off the market in the short term. I think the long-term question, though, is more interesting. If you were to see stability, how long would it take to get production up and running? And I've actually been talking to the people who did the Iraqi reparations and who ran the program to restore Iraqi production. And the dissimilarities between Venezuela are probably more interesting than the similarities. Uh, the fields in Venezuela, in uh, Iraq, and Libya are very large, uh, um, good resource fields that have a lot of um, pressure in them. Whereas if you look at Venezuela, particularly in the Lake Maracaibo area, there's a lot more wells and they're smaller wells and they may not have been maintained for the last 20 years. So you could get water intrusion into the wells, all kinds of things you know, from a reservoir engineering point of view could go wrong. Um, there were probably some quick fixes there, like, like for example, if you have a desalter down in your plant, you could probably spend relatively small amount of money and get your upgrader running again. So there may be some production you can get within a year but it will take at least six months to just evaluate the conditions on the ground and probably years to undo the 20 years of lack of investment. But I think the biggest issue is probably the lack of technocrats. Both Iraq and Libya had very good technocrats that stayed with the company. When U.S. sanctions on Libya ended and ConocoPhillips went back into Libya, I think we were positively surprised at how well the Libyan National Law Company maintained those assets. I don't think we see that in Venezuela. So it's actually going to probably, in my view, be a harder lift. 
but how do you get all the, the technocrats and professionals back into Venezuela? And, and also, if the U.S. wants to come in and help, how do you do that? We haven't conquered Venezuela. We may not be invited in. Just because they're angry with their current leader doesn't mean they're going to welcome foreign investment. They still have a lot of poor people whose needs aren't, aren't being met who might be resentful of that. So I think it is going to be a challenging uh, effort to uh, try to make this happen. And I know Bob has looked at this also. No, well said. No, well said. No, I uh, couldn't agree more. Marianne, no? For you? Yeah. And also the legal entanglements. What are the deals with China and Russia? Do they have liens on the assets? What do they own? Does ConocoPhillips get to reclaim its, its assets that they lost? I mean, we won the arbitration suit, and all we got from it were a bunch of tanks in the Caribbean. So I mean, there's still all these legal issues that have to be detangled in Venezuela as well. Jamie, you, you've been a regular at the OPEC meetings uh, over the last decades. How does uh, OPEC see Venezuela? The, how does the Secretariat deal with the problem of having a president uh, who might be two presidents? Mm -hmm. Uh, so I would say that, um, one, I agree with uh, Marianne's uh, point of view, which is totally correct, which is that OPEC is always reactive rather than proactive on anything. And then given its State of the Union night, I always, um, uh, I always compare OPEC as very similar to the U.S. Congress, which is that it is a low consensus organization uh, <laughs> that only acts when it absolutely has to act. And so... Um, they will, you know, they will evaluate it, but they're not going to, you know, they, they might put out some things and talk about it internally, but it's not going to change their kind of calculation on a, on a day by day um, uh, in terms of that. You, you've got to actually have that additional drop. And they've been dealing with that for the last, you know, couple of years, you know, where it's basically dropping the production, dropping by 60 to 100,000. Uh, barrels a day. So the the next kind of big meeting, aside from the potential wedding you you mentioned, uh, Bob, is in uh, April. And I think there's going to be talking about so many other. You know, they've got Iran that they've got to deal with. You've still got some instability in uh, Libya. You've always got something that's going on with Nigeria. What's going on with? So I think it's just going to be one more element that comes in there. Um, as Bob mentions in uh, in the book, you know, Venezuela was one of the key guys that really got OPEC going. Um, and as he also mentions in the book, the one thing uh, that companies, uh, organizations, fields that cannot cut want to happen is they want everybody else to cut uh, because they can't get it done and so then they want that uh, price to go up. But I think um, your point, Marianne, which is that this is going to be very confusing. I wonder if this is going to end up being like uh, Libya a couple of years ago, where two oil ministers were basically planning on coming to the, to the meeting two competing heads of, of government and trying to figure out that. And that, that I think, is going to be uh, an interesting thing in terms of, you know, how does that change over, if it happens, takes place. Just if I could uh, just add one point to this, and I'll be uncharacteristically um, optimistic and cheerful on the oil market. <laughs> if you just step back, though, and, and look at, you know, which countries on Earth have the potential to really ramp up production, which countries uh, producers have enormous reserves uh, and are arguably have been for either 20 years or 40 years sort of out of alignment with the rest of the world. I have two countries on my list, uh, Venezuela and Iran. Mm -hmm. And uh, it may be messy, um, it may be difficult, and the damage may be bad. But I think, and I'm hopeful we'll see this in our lifetimes, perhaps sooner rather than later with Venezuela, when we have governments in those countries that are more consonant with their people, I'm not saying they're going to be pro-American or pro-Western, but when we have governments uh, that can sort of restore the natural alignment of those countries in the international system, entrepreneurial, connected, uh, young, and vibrant, and we get investment in technology, and with the case of Iran, it's natural gas as well, and then gas pipelines, it's hard for me to imagine something likely to happen, don't know the timing, and better. So I'm, I'm, when it comes to those two countries, I think we're going to see great, great things if we live long enough. Could I comment on that? Because, I, you know, you may be, at some point I think yeah. you will be right, but let me go back to 1998 for those of you oil historians in the audience. In, in 1993, Venezuela undid its nationalization and had yeah. the apertura, 
and a lot of companies and investment went in. It took them four years to increase production by a million barrels a day, and that was under the absolute best of circumstances. But it turned out to be not such a great thing. Venezuela has heavy oil, and there aren't that many refineries in the Gulf Coast, or in the world, really, that, that can upgrade heavy oil. So what you saw is uh, Venezuela increased production a million barrels a day, the Saudis by a half a million heavy oil, and Mexico by a half a million. And lo and behold, there was a fight over linking deals in the Gulf Coast with U.S. refiners. I mean, Venezuela signed up two deals with Conoco and Phillips. Um, uh, Shell Deer Park signed up for Maya Crude from Mexico. And then the Saudis came in and they started the Motiva. Mm -hmm. So my point is this, is, this is what led up to the oil price collapse in 1998. And I remember there was a day in Houston that we had $11 oil prices, and there was one French restaurant in Houston that pegged the price of lunch to the price of WTI. <laughs> and so I got to have a consolation prize at cheap lunch that day. But my point is, you can't encourage that rapid expansion, particularly if it's a very specific type of oil, like right. heavy oil, that's not fungible, that not everyone can use, you will crater the market. Right, right. Okay, we had a question here. If you can, uh, just introduce yourself if you don't mind. If you introduce yourself. Yes, I'm Joe Allman. I'm a EMP analyst at a private investment bank. I know we're talking about production here, but uh, we'd love to get your comments on uh, your uh, expectations for China demand. I will go first, but I will welcome, uh, when I first met Antoine, I believe you were the demand analyst at the International mm -hmm. Energy Agency on the oil market report. So I'm going to speak uh, very, very quickly. Um, I believe Chinese demand is going to be um, higher than advertised and higher than forecasted in agency reports. I believe that um, the trend in per capita, future per capita oil demand in China, so the forecast, if you will, the IEO, the WIO, others, if you look at the trend and the revisions over the last several years, they have been upwards. I believe that in China, as in other countries, uh, there is wishful thinking about the impact of policy-driven uh, transformation and decarbonization of the transportation sector, particularly. And um, that um, China, like other countries, when forced to choose between um, uh, allowing their consumers to access both transportation and other things from oil, th um, that they, um, if the choice is between letting them access that or restricting that or putting a, a, a meaningful cost on that for the purposes of, and I want to say especially decarbonization, local air pollution is another thing. I think that will be more successful. You'll see quality control in fuels and so forth. But I think um, you know, demand is going to be, uh, over the longer term, much more robust. There will be fluctuations. I mean, God knows with their banking problems in the macro economy, uh, you know, it could cycle down from six, 700,000 barrels a day to 300,000 barrels a day. But I think China is going to be you know, solidly between half and a million barrels a day over the long run. It's going to surprise to the, surprise to the upside uh, for, for oil demand. But that's also a view I broadly hold for um, um, most countries. Yeah, it's, it's always tough to predict uh, Chinese demand. Uh, <coughs> we all know from experience. Uh, I think what's striking when we look at China now is with all the concerns about the slowdown in the, in the Chinese economy and user demand, consumer demand, demand for crude has been going through the roof. It's never been stronger. So imports uh, increased dramatically in, uh, in 2018. They were still extremely high in 2019, January. Uh, the uh, implied demand for crude refinery throughputs increased 11% in the fourth quarter of uh, 2018, and still about 7.5% in, uh, in January. So this is massive increase. Even if you had a booming economy, it would be very robust. This is not all for consumer demand domestically. Uh, some of that oil might go into domestic uh, strategic storage in caverns, uh, where they're difficult to, to track. Uh, and, and there's increasingly exports of products from China in, in the region and, and, and beyond. So China is emerging as a merchant refiner. But it's, if anything, the slowdown in the economy might actually uh, increase demand for crude, because I think it's encouraging um, the will of the provincial governments and the local governments to double down on the heavy manufacturing types of industries uh, that had uh, China take off in the last 20 years. Uh, there was an effort to move from that to consumer demand. But with the economy slowing down, there's going to be a, a, 
a step back and a, a fallback on the, the proven recipes of, of Chinese expansion, I think. Um, so we have a, a question that came over Twitter, which is interesting, although I'm not exactly sure um, how to understand it, but I'll... Yeah. That's Twitter for you. <laughs> oh, <right>. okay. <laughs> Did you send it, Jeremy? No, no, no. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, it, it says, how, uh, how should an OPEC plus uh, that was a real string producer cope with sanctions-related pressure among members, and does it require more coordination with consumers and sanctions implementers? So mm. the intersection of sanctions policy and OPEC policy. Yeah. yeah and, and my Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. How should it deal? Um, how can it get more? Yeah. How how, how do you think about um, it becoming less reactive, which right. all of you have pointed to, when there's an element of U.S. policy or other policy that might be hard to you know hard to predict? Sure. So take that as That's it is. That's a great and, question. No, and I'm Rachel Ziemba. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for Thanks. that question. I think we should first step back and probably drop in this question and for this context the word OPEC. OPEC really doesn't do anything. OPEC is a facade behind which Saudi Arabia, with a little help from its friends UAE and Kuwait, um, are willing and able to adjust supply. So I think in a way the question is, um, in this era where the United States is increasingly willing on the past three presidents to, if you will, weaponize oil, use oil as a weapon, let's be honest. Um, and, uh, you know, should there be better coordination uh, between the United States and Saudi Arabia primarily uh, to make sure there's no policy-driven uncertainty and surprises? I think the answer is yes. Um, you know, I think last year is again a great example where there were mismatched expectations. Um, and um, uh, I think we may face that again, as Marianne said, as we come up on, on May. Uh, and we also look at uh, the impact of Venezuela sanctions coming to Venezuela. One of the provisions in the recently announced sanctions, as you know, and the, the, one of the licenses will require the service companies to leave Venezuela after July. Now, you can import goons, you can import guns, you can import cash, but it's really hard to import really talented service company workers uh, and who know how to keep, especially Venezuela's oil flowing to the degree it is. And if we order those, uh, and I'm not saying it's a bad idea, I'm just saying let's all be aware that at the same time we're making decisions about how much we're gonna allow Iran to export in the second half, we also may be following through if the current regime, Maduro regime, survives that long on an order that will shut down the service sector, basically. In, in, and that ought to be discussed, um, whether at the wedding, at the you know, cocktails and afterwards, but, or, or, or the, there ought to be a discussion about that. And um, I think there is, to be honest. I, there's been some press reports about certain State Department officials and certain Saudi oil officials uh, getting together. Uh, I think that's not new news. So I think, and I think the um, turmoil of the last uh, half year has been a, taught a lesson. And so I think there's going to be going forward. But I take your point. It is actually is very important to do that. Wow. Uh, hi there. Thanks very much, Michael Dobson. Um, doing a PhD down the New School. Just here two years ago. Bought the book. Read it. Loved it. Thank um, you. So <laughs> thank you. Uh, Would you I was, like to join the panel? We can move on. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, wait to hear what I say next. Uh, I was fascinated in particular by the figure of Juan Pablo Perez Alfonso, the, one of the founding fathers yeah. of OPEC. Uh, and I, I was wondering, if he was alive today, do you think he would see a role for OPEC or OPEC Plus or a swing producer uh, in responding to climate change and oh. in advancing the transition away from oil by a stable price, not perhaps between 60 and 80, but elevating over time, gradually increasing? That is, a, that is a wonderful question, and I have an unorthodox answer for you. As you may know, and I don't think I talked too much about uh, Juan Perez Alfonso, uh, I didn't talk about 
after he left OPEC, and he became very disenchanted. He called oil the devil's excrement, I think it was. He became disgusted with the oil industry, with the oil curse, what it did to Venezuela. And if he was alive today, he'd probably be disgusted with climate change and, and the other um, issues surrounding oil. So I bet you Juan Perez Alfonso, if he was here today, um, the founder of OPEC, who spent the 50s in the exile in the United States, went down to Austin and couldn't believe that just a bunch of officials got together every month and did a call on Texas and then imposed quarters back by the police, thought there's a great, that, that, that fella, he would welcome the end of uh, supply control and he'd welcome boom bust oil prices because there's nothing in my view that is more likely to put an end to oil uh, and, and, and let, let me put it this way, uh, to incentivize uh, an investment and a search for alternatives to oil and especially transportation than continued wild right. boom bust oil price, prices. It was spindle top in, and the huge spines in Texas in the early 1900s that came along while they were perfecting the internal combustion engine, which convinced everybody to say, put the electric car away, put the ethanol car away, even though we're going to debate that for the next 150 years, every few years. But those went, it was that abundance and that stability. Rockefeller provided 25 years of stability. So I bet you he would say, let it rock and let it roll. Let it swing and let it flow. Let that price go up and down. I don't want to see an affected producer because that will put oil out of business. And that's why it's in the oil market, oil industry's conversely interest to get some modicum of stability back. Great question. Thank you. Uh, Tamar Asner, I'm an energy analyst at NASDAQ. Um, two questions. Number one, uh, U.S. shale, uh, the wells declined really um, fast. quickly, yeah. very fast. What is the significance of that over time, if, if any? And then the other question was sort of alluded to with the spreads, increasing spreads between heavy oil prices and light oil prices and the fact that shale, which is basically the, the biggest source of growth uh, outside of OPEC, is light sweet, but most of the refiners are geared toward the uh, heavier grades. What is the significance of that maybe as it relates to IMO or just generally with the, we talk generally about oil prices, but I think it's really the increase spreads that might be significant. Right. Well, I can comment on the shale piece. Uh, I think shale decline rates are very misunderstood. Decline rates have probably steepened, but that's because it's much more economic to get the oil out of the ground faster. It improves the project economics. So the oil industry would view it as a technology improvement that, that they've managed to even steepen what was already a steep decline rate, because you get most of the value in the first 18 months. The people are not understanding is how that translates to a whole basin. If you have many wells that are more than 18 months old, they drop into this really flat tail, and you build up all these flat tails, and lo and behold, in a basin, the decline rates are much lower. So you cannot equate a well decline rate to a basin decline rate. Also, what it does mean for a company, though, is that they need to keep investing capital. It is very capital intensive, shale versus some other projects that you probably think of being capital intensive, like a deep water project. You're having to continually invest. So I think there is a lot of misunderstanding about decline rates. In terms of the heavy light differential, it's interesting. Right now, heavy crude is scarce, mostly because Venezuelan production and quality has continued to go down. The Mexican heavy oil production is going down. Uh, China, uh, China, Canada cannot get more heavy crude to the Gulf Coast. It costs about $18 a barrel to get a rail car now today to take more Canadian crude to the Gulf Coast. I mean, the economics are not very good. So there's a general shortage of heavy crude, so heavy oil pricing has um, gone up relative to light oil pricing. Also, the OPEC cutback tended to take off more medium sour barrels, so that has become um, more dear relative to light right, prices, particularly when you have all this light tight oil. There's a lot more light oil in the world. So heavy has become more valuable. That will completely reverse on January 1st, 2020, when you have to get rid of about half of the uh, three and a half to four million barrels a day of high sulfur fuel oil, bunker fuel in the world. Suddenly, you'll have a surplus of heavy fuel oil, and that will depress the prices. To give you an example, crudes like Maya and, and the Venezuelan heavy, they have about 35 to 40 percent yield of high sulfur fuel oil. So those crudes are really going to drop in value. So what we're seeing today will absolutely reverse on January 1st, 2020.
As a shameless plug on your last answer, uh, as a Brazilian, medium suites in Brazil are probably going to get a nice pickup from that Indeed. as well. Indeed. <laughs> um, Fernando Valle, uh, Bloomberg Intelligence, I cover oil majors and refiners. Um, my question uh, was in regards to Saudi Arabia, since OPEC is no longer a thing. Um, their cost has, you can make a case that their cost has actually gone up and they were on a fiscal break even level. And part of the, the rise in, this, in, in oil prices over the last 20 years was them trying to adjust their fiscal, their balance sheet to that. So the question is, if you really believe in the earlier question on a peak demand within the next 50 years, how does MBS or whoever rules Saudi Arabia adjust that balance sheet to the fat, to, to the stranded reserve risks, right? They have the, outside of Venezuela, they have the highest reserves in the world and they need to lower their fiscal break even, but at the same time, they have so many reserves that they can't possibly produce it all before we're over the age of oil. So how do you balance that? And if shale can keep growing, how do you seed market share to set shale if you're adjusting your production now? Well, yeah, well, there's different ways of looking at this, but uh, I guess if you, if you do take the hypothesis of uh, peak demand that, uh, for, for granted, if you take that as your working assumption, then you're, you're gonna have winners and losers uh, and it's possible that uh, low-cost producers like the Saudis, uh, low-cost producers, maybe high budget requirements, but low-cost anyway, uh, might end up as the winners because uh, if indeed there's concerns about stranded assets and that, that inhibits investment in the upstream, uh, the, the last guy standing will be the, uh, the OPEC producers and the, the Middle East producers, the low-cost producers. So it might work out for them in a way. Uh, one other comment on the um, so this discussion about uh, fiscal break evens and how Saudi and other com countries uh, often spend uh, over that. So the the number that I always look at is actually the current account balance, which is actually looking at your imports versus exports. So if you look back historically, Venezuela outspent its fiscal balances for years and years and years before everything went to heck. And then in 2014, it was that their uh, uh, they were unable to pay for their imports. Uh, and so that really hit, and then that's when suddenly everything hit. So you can actually deal with a, a fiscal balance where you're not, not in balance and you're spending, quote unquote, too much, but it really only matters when you actually are not able to pay for those imports. Right. That's when it really kind of uh, hits it. But it also, I totally agree with Antoine's point. So even if you have peak demand, somebody's still gonna be providing that kind of, whatever the base is at the, at the bottom, and Saudi is in a, a very good position to, to do that. But at lower prices. Yes, that's right. Yes. Yeah. Right, but I think there's also an effort by those producers to capture mm -hmm. a the, uh, the the last growth markets, particularly the Asian you know, East of Suez markets, uh, and there's a lot of investment in the downstream by producers, both Gulf producers and Russia, to 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 lock in that that market share. Uh, but there's also a lot of investment down the supply chain, down the, the value chain. Uh, in the petrochemical industry, because there's expectations that actually peak demand, uh, electrification and so on, might actually increase demand for plastics, some plastics, new, new plastic materials, uh, which are made of oil. So that's, uh, that's one of the elements of the strategy, I think, to respond to, to the threat of stranded assets and peak demand. Okay, good question. So, uh, other question, can you discuss the effects of uh, crude hedging by the industry on, on price swings? Uh, so not the, the effect of swings on, on hedging, but hedging on swings. Right. And uh, why does this not successfully dampen uh, price volatility? Is liquidity in the hedge market for various reasons not sufficient to balance the supply demand dynamic? Yeah, you can't, you can't hedge the whole market. All the market can do is shift the risk from one party to another, but somebody's holding the hot potato. Uh, someone's holding the risk. And so um, at the systemic, you know, at, the, at the broad market level, again, you can't hedge the whole market. So um, hedging uh, is a, uh, a great tool. Um, and I, I speculate in the book, I wonder if consumers start to see this boom and bust, whether we'll see more maybe even swarms of consumer hedging, uh, buying clubs, and like they do with heating oil, where you lock in a long-term contract, we may get innovative there. Um, so I think hedging is a great tool. Uh, and um, for consumers exposed to the volatility especially, you're starting to see Developing countries go to the World Bank. I think Uruguay has done this and, and, and use hedging and, and swaps and things to get some price stability in their imports. So it's a great tool for individual actors, but at the market level, 
who takes the other side of the whole market. Someone's, there's going to be risk in, in that market that someone's going to be holding. I would like to add to that that the fact that producers in the U.S. hedge means they're less responsive right. to price drops, and right. it'll take them longer to That's respond. Right. So that is not That's a good a thing in terms of market right. stability. Mm -hmm. Do you have any more questions from the audience? Capo? Um, okay. Does the current distribution model of mainly commodity trading firms affect the ability of a swing producer to actually control prices? Does the current distribution of the, the distribution model? So right now, it's, you know, it used to be seven sisters, long term fixed contracts, but now with spot oil, right. or Trafigura, Beach Hall, and then people actually getting oil to consumers. Does their ability to move oil around really reduce our ability to have a swing producer? Well, it hmm. certainly makes markets more efficient, which means their prices are more volatile right. in an efficient market. So, I mean, it has that effect. It's more transparent and efficient but, today. Right. Uh, I agree. And, and through history, because we have to remember, and this is a kind of a, I guess I knew this, but so with the, from the research really came out, in the United States, we've always had spot markets. And third party, uh, there's never been... Uh, well, in the 70s, there were some price controls briefly, but that was an exception. From the very beginning, it was spot markets, and no, uh, and 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 uh, the, what we did is regulate supply. Even during the period where the Seven Sisters had formula pricing and so forth internationally, and then Gulf Plus, and the book goes into all that, and that did not impede um, the Seven Sisters from being very effective. But I take Marianne's point; it's I think better probably to have a very transparent spot liquid market. But as long as there's effective wellhead control. And an institution that's able, willing, and with proven success to, to, to adjust that supply, uh, it ought to work. It's worked in both, it worked both ways. I think the, the role of information in regulating the market is very important. And <clears throat> there is an um, information revolution going on in the, in the oil industry uh, with new providers, you know, data, um, providers, satellite imaging, uh, machine learning. That's a, a, a real game changer, which is just appearing in the market, but I think will have a big, uh, big impact. Uh, probably reduce some of the competitive advantage of the big traders uh, and, and level the playing field to some degree, uh, but make it much easier for the market to, to, um, to play arbitrage opportunities. Uh, there was one more question, I think I saw it, yes? Hi, uh, Jeff Maurer at Platts. Uh, Marion, to your point about uh, Gulf Coast refiners and their reliance on Venezuelan crude, what, uh, who do you think is going to fill that gap? I mean, if it seems like a good opportunity, right? So it seems like a very good opportunity for Canada, but it's difficult to get more crude down there. Do you think that pressure, that opportunity will, will I don't know, somehow change the 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 atmosphere in, in Alberta or in Canada to actually bring more crude down. Some of the, the actions taken by Alberta recently, I think, you know, had some unintended consequences. I don't know if you saw that Imperial came out last week and said, hey, we can't rail anymore because you closed the ARB on us, basically. Right. Um, I would like to think that Canada would take advantage of that opportunity, but I'm just not convinced, having watched, you know, their capacity situation, uh, or limited export capacity situation in the making over the last two decades. Um, so I think what U.S. Gulf Coast refiners will do is they will substitute less heavy or more medium crudes in their coker, and they won't be able to run their coker as efficiently. So they're going to um, operate in a suboptimal fashion. And I mentioned earlier, I think that will actually reduce product yields, like you'll have less diesel fuel. So it will have an impact on the market. but. You know, and Canada did increase its um, production. They cut back and they increased by 75,000 barrels a day. But it's that $18 rail tariff and heated rail cars that you that is going to keep you from um, sending that more crude down to the Gulf Coast. That's a pretty long distance. Uh, getting over the border, as you know, is difficult without pipelines. And you have heated rail cars. And the rail companies, I think, are asking for these long-term contracts if you want to ship with them. No, refiners don't want to do that. Right. Right. But if they insist on long-term contracts, you're not, you're not seeing people signing up for more rail. So, and the, the economics of an $18, you know, discount off the price because you have to spend it on transportation, whereas a pipeline tariff 
would be like nine dollars. So it, the economics are just not good. Jan? Maybe there's a lady down there back there too. So. Okay. Hi. Uh, thank you very much, all of you. Uh, Jan Stewart with Cornerstone Macro. Uh, in the spirit of a wasted Super Bowl and the State of the Union, perhaps <laughs> I could ask all of you four to give us a prognostication on what to expect next on uh, one, Iran sanctions, more or less, over the course of the year. Two, Venezuela, more or less sanctions. And then three, are we going to see sanctions on Russian oil? Good Easy line. one. Okay. Uh, Iran, as long as uh, Brent is within spitting distance of 60, um, I think they will take another few hundred thousand barrels a day um, out of Iran's exports. They will cancel some waivers, renew others at lower volumes. So I think it's, uh, they'll take another bite out there. I don't think there's a likelihood of zeroing out. Um, on Venezuela, uh, if M Mr. Maduro doesn't cave in the next sort of days to weeks, I think the chances of uh, tighter sanctions are, are high in the United States. We're very close to secondary sanctions. It wouldn't take much more to make them secondary sanctions where we really do uh, require every country on the planet to decide whether to work with Venezuela or the United States. We don't, haven't quite got there, but we're getting close. I think any provocation by Maduro, uh, any harm to U.S. diplomats, any harm to Mr. Guaido, any mass repression or killing and things would probably quickly bring us to, at the very least, tighter sanctions. Um, and the third one was? Uh, Russia. Russia. Um, Oil, no, I, uh, I, I don't see, uh, I, what we would, presumably we would, uh, I, I, know, I, don't, I don't see anything uh, likely on that. I, I think one thing, you know, when you really get into it, even in the Northeast, they take that Russian oil in occasionally and things and the gas. I, I don't think they're going to want to, you know, with the Jones Act and the pipeline, I, I, I think that even in the Northeast, they're not really thrilled about touching uh, Russian oil. So I'm going to say we're unlikely. Uh, to sanction uh, Russian oil. There's just too many other oligarchs and juicy targets we can go after without having to uh, uh, go after the oil, but maybe others have But, Paul, I actually have a question for you. How yeah. does your view compare with the President's desire to have low gasoline prices going into the election year and, sa and sanctions? Uh, well, um, the Rapid End Energy Group does a very careful global oil balance, as you know. And um, we uh, have been and remain a little softer uh, than most folks. So we think that um, even if the Trump administration, let's say, reduces Iran's exports in the second half from, oh, about 1.3 million barrels a day to eight or 900,000 barrels a day, that with the, let's say, lagged compliance of Russia, uh, the uh, you know lagged compliance of Iraq, uh, the soaring growth of shale, which so far is genuine crude oil anyway, um, we think the president can probably pull that off without risking uh, high oil prices. The loss of Venezuela, however, uh, would put that at risk. So I think if the Maduro regime lasts until the summer, um, the administration will think very carefully about marching those service companies out. I, would be not, I wouldn't be surprised if we kind of eased back on that, because one thing the president has shown, beyond a shadow of a doubt, with Iran, and this is very important for the IMO discussion, the only thing the president hates more than Iran or Venezuela's Maduro is high pump prices. And if he's forced to choose between the two, he'll go with getting oil prices down. So, um, well, not, not easy questions. Um, Iran, I think Iranian supply is much higher than it appears. Uh, I think there's a, a very high amount of uh, Iranian barrels that make their way to the market uh, off the radar. Uh, probably more than half of uh, Iranian exports in the last couple of months were really off the radar. So you have to multiply by two the, the uh, consensus view of the Iranian exports to get what the real exports are. Uh, that partly explains why the price is not higher today. Uh, so I think we're not likely to see more sanctions, I think, on um, uh, uh, removal of all uh, 
uh, waivers uh, in May. But uh, even if we do, I think there's a, a significant amount of Iranian oil that does make its way to the market. Uh, Venezuela is, is, a, is a problem, so it's hard to be optimistic. It, it, you can be optimistic politically. You can hope for a good outcome of this situation. And it, it looks like maybe Venezuela is fi finally at a turning point where things will, will look up and uh, move in the right direction. But for the oil sector, it's going to be very hard to get the, the oil sector back, in, uh, back on its feet and uh, uh, back in uh, up and running, uh, I think it's going to be a question of you know the the the, the precedents that we've had in previous in other countries for rebuilding the oil sector for for nation rebuilding, state rebuilding, and and the sector rebuilding, not very encouraging. If you look at Libya, Iraq, uh, not particularly successful. Uh, of course, Venezuela is very different. It had you know democratic institutions a long time uh, before the, the the current meltdown. So there's a, a legacy to build on. Uh, but it's, it's hard to be, to be very optimistic in the short term, I think. Um, and Russia, I, I think, so our colleague at uh, the Center on Global Energy Policy, um, Richard Nephew, who was a, a sanctions expert in the uh, Obama administration, uh, I think has a view that we are likely to see Russian sanctions uh, uh, targeting perhaps the, the oil sector uh, with a new democratic majority in, in, the, in Congress, uh, more momentum for hard... Uh, Biting measures against Russia. Prognostications? You guys have? Marianne? No, I, I will pass on that question. Uh, I'll, I'll answer uh, briefly. I, Bob's a good friend, so I always uh, dislike uh, agreeing with him in public. <laughs> um, but uh, what I would say is uh, so I, I agree that uh, as long as prices stay down, Iran, he'll continue to try to uh, go after those, whether there's uh, barrels that we're not aware of or not, I think there's still going to be some additional uh, pressure there. I think for uh, Venezuela, there's going to be additional pressure over the next couple of weeks, couple of months. And then after that, the, the calculus will also flip to the same sort of calculus as it is for Iran. Uh, I think on Russia, I think a combination of there's been difficulty with the Treasury Department in getting sanctions on Russia dialed in, right? It's, a, it's kind of a blunt tool. Uh, and so I think they'll actually probably hold off on oil because of that whole concern about prices ending up uh, going too high. Also, I think there will be probably some recognition that while they are kind of working with this OPEC plus group, we don't want to, you know, we want to kind of keep that uh, going as long as it is still kind of doing what uh, at least I think in the president's mind is his, is his bidding with, uh, with lower prices. So, but happy to argue with you over a drink there. Yeah. <laughs> we had a lady in the back. Did we have a lady in the back who had a question? Yeah, I think we have time for. Uh, How about IMO? We haven't talked about IMO, and That's, I know we have different views. We have to get to views. the State of the Union. We can't. <laughs> so. Someone have a question? Yeah. Okay, Ed. Yeah. yeah. Thanks very much, um, Ed Crooks from the Financial Times. I wanted to ask about NOPEC legislation. Mm. Um, given everything you've said about the benefits of. Um, uh, price fixing and how cartels are a wonderful thing for the industry. Do you think <laughs> NOPEC legislation is completely misguided? Do I think it's misguided? Uh, yes, I do. I think it, uh, and with this, I will never be confirmed for anything. But I <laughs> what I'm about to say, I think there's almost a direct relationship between how popular and bipartisan an energy policy is and how dumb it is. <laughs> Uh, and I think oh, no, OPEC, NOPEC is a great example of that. Um, this is something, though, we may have to actually turn on the stove, heat up the coil, and grab it with both hands to learn the lesson. Uh, we are just a tweet away from NOPEC becoming law. Uh, it is one of the few things left in Washington, D.C., where there is broad bipartisan support and both sides of the aisle, and the president strongly supports it. He's written three pages of a book. Uh, on, on uh, extolling NOPEC. Um, and this goes back to, again, this popular memory in the United States that if oil prices are going up and we're being gouged, therefore, the remedy is to take the gouger, uh, you know, to court. And uh, although Rockefeller was not accused of gouging per se, it was nefarious practices, we've, mel we've meshed the two. And so we remember Standard Oil was broken up by the Sherman Antitrust Act, and so you sue a gouger. Um, and I think we've sort of forgotten the 40 years when we were the mother of OPEC, uh, and with government support and bayonets, we <laughs> regulated the price almost perfectly. Uh, we've forgotten that. 
And now that the regulator are Middle East countries primarily, with whom we may not be uh, infatuated at all times, uh, when we're being gouged by a foreign country, uh, the natural and obvious, and if I may, American solution is to haul them into court. And um, I think it would, uh, uh, first of all, I think, you know, I think we'd have to just mail boxes of Kleenex to Texas and North Dakota because if we right. actually were successful right. in dissuading producers from attempting to collectively manage supply, uh, and we saw the full-throated boom-bust oil prices come back. Had we had that at the case in February of 2016 and oil prices wouldn't have stopped at 26, I think we would have seen real pain. And uh, I, can, I will predict that if we, um, if we pass NOPEC and we start to sue these producers, not only will we expose our businesses and government officials around the world to retaliatory suits, because the way you do it is, is you remove the sovereign, sovereign doctrine, and that has broader ramifications that are extremely destabilizing. But I almost think this is a case where we almost have to live without uh, a swing producer and maybe outlaw it to experience what they experienced from 1911 to 1932 and what compelled Governor Ross Sterling to send the troops into East right. Texas. And I think after a good dose of uh, NOPEC, and uh, if it was successful, uh, we would end up begging them to reunite, get back in business, and start su controlling supply. Uh, that was a great way to conclude this uh, conversation. Uh, we've run out of time. I think we could keep going for a while, but uh, we, we have to uh, call uh, an end to this discussion. Uh, so I just want to say uh, we have a couple of events coming up uh, tomorrow night. There's uh, another discussion of uh, what's next for climate policy with uh, Car Carlos Cobello, a uh, former congressman from uh, Florida, uh, Christina Costa, Alex Flint, Rihanna Gunwright. It's going to be moderated by John Elkind, uh, our colleague from the uh, Center on Global Energy Policy. And then in, uh, on February 18th, there's an event on uh, electric vehicle charging in China and, and the US, uh, led by David Sandelow, uh, Shirley Chang, Kevin Tu, my former colleague from the IEA, and uh, Sheng Yan, our uh, CJEP, Center of Global Energy Policy, uh, represent man in, in Beijing. Uh, and of course, on Friday, uh, Bob is playing uh, can in I, the desert. Can I, just on that, I mean, um, on Friday, something you all have been craving for a long time is going to arrive in Washington, D.C. <coughs> Sound policy. And if you can be down there then at the Villain and Saint at 8 o'clock, bring earplugs because it's going to get unhinged. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Thanks for coming. And thank you to our speakers. <laughs>